You're watching the New Stack Makers, a podcast for people who develop, deploy, and manage at scale software. For more information and articles about at scale technologies, please visit thenewstack.io. Now enjoy the show. Chronosphere is the only observability platform that puts you back in control by taming rampant data growth and cloud native complexity, delivering increased business confidence. Engineering organizations trust Chronosphere to help them operate scalable, highly available, and resilient applications. Hello, everyone, and welcome to an on the road episode of the New Stack Makers. I'm your host, Heather Joslin, for the New Stack. Today, we're coming to you from the floor at QCon and Cloud Native Con. North America here in Chicago, that toddling town. And uh, today we're going to take up the topic of building internal tooling in your organization. How can you tell if you're building the right one? How can you, uh, what can you do if the people you're building it for don't, don't use it? Um, we're going to be talking to someone who knows a bit about building internal tools, Rob Skillington of Chronosphere. Um, Rob has both succeeded and not so much at, 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 with internal projects in the past. He's got some stories to tell about, about how to build internal tools that are successful mm. and about how his experiences at Uber have shaped his uh, experience building his own company, Chron Chronosphere. Mm. Hi, Rob. Thank you for welcoming me. Yeah, it's great to be back. I mean, uh, and in Chicago, no less. Yeah. Rob, can you tell us a little bit about Chronosphere? Yeah, I'd love to. So we are a observability tool and platform that's completely reimagining how observability is done in the cloud native world. Mm. And... A lot of the platforms historically have really, uh, you know, organically added support for all these new things. But it turns out you actually need to reimagine how you collect it, how you actually process the data, and then also how you visualize it and interact with the data. And so we've really been reimagining that from fi first principles. Okay, great. And we also want to mention that uh, Chronosphere is sponsoring today's conversation. Right. Which we appreciate. Yes. <laughs> uh, so let's get started. Uh, when people think of internal tooling, whether it's monitoring or observability, CI, CD, et cetera, um, they often think of it as a build versus buy question. Yes. Is that the right question to ask? I really think it's not the right question it, in terms of the way that it's framed. It's the right question philosophically, but the way in which it's asked is typically you know, do you build or you buy? It turns out in practice, the um, what you're actually doing is much more complicated and mm. uh, nuanced because you're never purely just building or buying. It's, uh, unless you're building everything from the ground up again, mm. uh, going back 50 years in time, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and writing your own operating system and, you know, uh, creating your own chips. In a, mm. uh, you really are building um, on top of things that already exist. And mm. it's just really a uh, manner of how much do you layer in of the build and the buy. Mm. And I think that the thing that's more important actually is first, before even asking that question, understanding number one, what are the different uh, abstractions? And once you understand the abstractions of what you're trying to do, uh, then you can start to understand, well, where are the boundaries in which you can build and buy mm. um, and com combine the build and buy uh, into a, a solution that solves the whole problem. And, and then once you've developed the abstractions, at, at, which is really important because then you're not just solving for today, right? Mm. The short term, you're solving for the longer term because right. you understand the entire um, landscape better. Mm. And then once you understand that landscape, you kind of can then start to carve out individual components that you can tell whether you, you know, could I build or buy here? And have I drawn the boundary at the right level so that uh, if I do want to ever revisit this decision, can I do so without having to change the, uh, the interface between the abstractions? You know, mm. if the, will the protocol still keep working? Will, um, you know, in the observability world, can I bring my dashboards from one system mm. to another? Um, yeah. And, and then once you've kind of been able to do those first two tasks of abstraction layers, analyze each one, the third and last task is like understanding when should I revisit for each one of those, mm -hmm. the decision I'm making today around building or buying in one of those individual areas. Because that's what I found is the most important kind of relationship uh, to, to understand going into, into this process of, under, of building versus, uh, building or buying in a 
a, an area to solve a problem that you have. Mm. So thinking about the long term, not just solving the problem right now, but yeah. down the road when the technology changes, are you, is this going to be flexible enough? Is this going to be exactly. adaptable enough? Yeah, and I would say that while people, they don't 100% ignore it necessarily, right? Like they do future-proof their mm. plans, but I think perhaps the analysis of the different boundaries and the contract between those boundaries mm. um, is not often as deeply analyzed. People just simply think, oh, as long as I choose an open standard, mm. you know, uh, vendor or tool or platform, then it doesn't really matter. I'm, I'm not locked in. Yeah. But it turns out that like, even though that's true, there are incompatibilities between visualization elements. Like, you know, if you're using Grafana internally, that locks you into a certain set of things. Mm. Um, and then, uh, you know, it, it's much more nuanced than each layer. So, um, when it comes to shipping good tooling, um, is it true or false that if you build it, they will come? Right. And I think that is the, the, the answer to that question is not always. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I've experienced firsthand um, that a few times. Okay. And, uh, you know, I can tell you about some of those experiences. And, but the, the, you know, the major takeaways for me is kind of understanding when to kind of reanalyze and reassess that first projection of the layers and the abstractions that you chose. Mm. It's, it's really important um, to, to understand when you should revisit those uh, criteria of why you chose something, right? Because yeah. what we've found sometimes when they haven't come, for, for instance, um, you know, we were building a, a visualization platform internally at Uber at one point, and it was not as popular as um, the de facto tool that we had. Uh -huh. And we found out only 50 or 60 users were even, you know, using yeah. um, the system uh, daily, whereas the de facto tool had a thousand uh, engineers per day uniquely using the system. So um, we should have really understood that as a KPI going into the project, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Not kind of like working out at the end of it, oh, yeah, is anyone using this? <laughs> so, you know, I think it's really important to do a bit of that thinking up front. Okay. So know your know your audience and what they're what they want first. Yeah, know well. your audience. How are you grading the criteria on the tool you're buying mm -hmm. and building, and and using that knowledge of knowing your audience, you know what what is the most important thing that for this problem you're solving mm -hmm. to be tracking and understanding if it's meeting its criteria or not. Um, tell me about not invented here syndrome. Mm -hmm. um, how can you tell if that's present in an engineering organization? That's a really tough question because the answer is very vague that I'm, I, I give, <laughs> Oh, we love vague answers on this podcast. <laughs> um, I oh, think, just, yes, kidding. I feel like, I mean, I, someone could do a master's class on that, I, I definitely believe. And I, I think that um, the thing about the not invented here syndrome, and, and from my time, you know, I started off my career at Microsoft, right? And mm -hmm. that was very heavy on the spectrum uh, towards a lot of not invented here um, uh, kind of culture. Mm -hmm. And I would say at a certain point, I couldn't really fault the company too much because I understood that Apple had their own ecosystem, right? Yeah. Microsoft has theirs. And there's really a design kind of bled into the system where the, the more things that they use in the micro, Microsoft universe, everything the experience gets better and better, right? Yeah. That is part of the reason why at, at Microsoft perhaps they were heavy on the spectrum because it actually improved the product, I suppose, some of that culture. But mm -hmm. I, I do think it was really difficult to work inside that company with that because sometimes they were building things that, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think necessarily needed to be rebuilt um, mm -hmm. for the sake of rebuilding it. Yeah. And so um, I would say that, you know, to, to more fully answer your question, I, I think it, it shows up in conversations really easily. Mm -hmm. Like when you're kind of around a table, a mm. set of engineers or on Zoom, obviously these days, um, or some other conferencing software, um, really just seeing where the center of gravity is when people start to propose ways to solve problems. Uh -huh. um, you can kind of see if they gravitate towards the, the, well, should we check out how other people do it? Yeah. Or should we just jump to a solution that's likely an internally built thing, you know, immediately. Yeah. And so I think that's a that's one good signal. Um, and then I would say that just, you know, the the other thing is just kind of looking around at the history of the company and what's yeah. 
the, those decisions? Are they well documented? Right, Uber was much more rational because it was, you know, had come a much younger company mm. trying to achieve a goal uh, in terms of becoming a profitable business and, and such. And, you know, you, you needed to get to the where you were trying to go quite quickly yeah. uh, because it was, the, the faster the business moved, the, the more likely, you know, that, that um, we could fulfill our goal of uh, infrastructure as reliable as running, running water. Yeah. So anyway, I, I think even though it was more rational though, there definitely were pockets of not invented here things mm. because once you get to an organization where they've solved one or two things that definitely did need to come in-house, yeah. it starts to pervade a bit more of the culture yeah. to those teams and those sister teams nearby. Yeah. And so, yeah, that that's... It's, it's a tough thing to do, but like th there are multiple indicators. What are some examples of build versus buy decisions that you were part of? Um, maybe, uh, I think w one thing I've heard about is the M3 uh, yes. story at, at Uber. M3 was really born out of the fact that we had a really complex distributed system that was containerized and, be, you know, in a cloud native mm -hmm architecture where people hadn't really brought 4,000 different microservices along to a cl cloud native workload before mm. uh, that quickly, right? Mm. And so the, the system was very complex at high scale and had transitioned from a v VM virtual machine based world uh -huh. to containerization as well. So you had a lot of these compounding factors in terms of um, how difficult it was to really understand that stack and it required a lot of raw telemetry data to understand that stack and so m3 mm. was born to really cater to the fact that we needed levels of scale that that weren't previously necessary mm. uh, given those like main contributing factors mm. and so that that's where it was born okay okay and and I guess um you know to to kind of like revisit the journey a little bit. Sure. M3 and the observability tools at Uber actually started out as, you know, being um, platforms and solutions that we we bought and vendors operated for us. Hmm. And so M3 started to replace a sliver of that mm -hmm. in the, um, and then over time uh, expand to a much larger footprint mm -hmm. as more parts of the Uber stack continued to get more complicated mm -hmm. and requiring in-house uh, scale uh, solutions. Mm -hmm. And so the, the other thing though as well is, uh, and why Chronosphere you know, exists is it wasn't just the raw telemetry data though, it was the way in which you interacted with the data mm -hmm. uh, because you need a, a view into this system that's understandable if, if you're going to be pivoting around 4,000 microservices. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, in fact, I remember the tracing diagram. It was always, it would co <laughs> completely blow your, uh, your like everyone's mind off, off of its um, head and shoulders. Uh, so, and it was, so it was really about like getting in and orienting you around the part of the system that was experiencing problems mm -hmm. and, and having a lot of jumping off points to get you to that place quickly and effectively and reliably, mm -hmm. regardless of your experience as a, you know, as an engineer or, or your tenure at the company. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, so anyway, you know, M3 at first was on Cassandra and Elasticsearch as uh, the so storage solutions. It was really a thin layer and we had a abstraction of graphite in the early days. So M3 actually mm -hmm. was a graphite backend. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I think the, the abstraction layers are really important here. Because mm -hmm. it actually did work out well for us, not reinventing you know, the, the telemetry type. Yeah. Um, and we could focus on what was important to the business, which was the scale and how we interacted with the data. Uh, we okay. did, of course, then uh, move to offer a Prometheus style uh, metrics interface to people mm -hmm. and and then M3 was able to in implement both those abstractions and so uh, there was one cohesive unit to run both of them but uh, you know a lot of that was uh, bought right like mm -hmm. the Cassandra and Elasticsearch um, were, were not vanilla off, off the shelf solutions right. uh, you know we had 
uh, help from Datastax as well uh, mm -hmm. with Cassandra. Uh, and so th it was only later when we needed to completely leapfrog yet again the next level of um, scale and, and complexity that we then went to the layer of taking that storage level out and completely writing the time series database from scratch mm. and the aggregator uh, from scratch. Did you have success in getting people to to use it? Yes. Uh, yeah, That so that's a success story. Okay. Uh, the, the, the one we talked about before was uh, not a success story. Okay. Uh, but no, M3 was you know, massively uh, utilized. More than a thousand daily users uh, oh, were interacting with it through mm -hmm. the dashboarding. And uh, we had more than a few hundred thousand alerts on there. And I mean, it really it was really interesting seeing how that drop off, like the hours people would log in and spend interacting with the data, it, it mm. mimics like where we worked around the world, right? Because more than half of our engineering force was using it daily. We mm. only had 2,000 engineers at the company at that time. Mm. And so uh, it just goes to show that observability is, is fundamentally uh, such a necessity to every software engineer's life mm. uh, that works on any backend infrastructure mm. because without it, this all the digital infrastructure would just collapse, right? We wouldn't have enough uh, capabilities to, to operate these things at any levels of complexity. Mm. And so, you know, I, I actually think that observability is helping us build the biggest, uh, bigger and better digital skyscrapers, you know, mm. for, for lack of a better yeah. analogy. Yeah. Um, and I think it's it, it shows in the user data that how important it is to every everyone's job to do their job effectively mm. at scale and quickly um, at at rapid speeds of development. Um, you had an announcement at KubeCon. Uh, do you want to tell me a little bit about that? Um, of course, yeah, I'd love to. Yeah. Uh, so Chronosphere Lens, which I'm really excited about personally mm -hmm. uh, to bring, is really the first major f footprint in, in terms of our expansion into solving the complexity with how you interact with this cloud-native data. As we chatted about, you know, uh, just before, it's not just the the raw scale and aggregation, which a, yeah. a, a lot a lot of people obviously know, Chronosphere for our control plane and mm -hmm. being able to do to fit much more observability use cases in much less dollars for you. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also about giving you that view into the system that gets your job done much quicker, uh, and so that helps you remediate issues much faster. It mm -hmm. helps you uh, orient yourselves. It helps you onboard engineers. It helps you be um, more competitive in your own business, core business because you can develop and respond to market shifts and dynamics quicker because your observability is much more um, useful. It helps you get there quicker uh, and reliably without you know, having hours of downtime. Chronosphere Lens is the developer experience behind that and the spiritual uh, successor to what we built internally at Uber to solve that problem. And it's, it's taken us a few years to get there, but I'm, I'm really excited about how compelling uh, we all wrapped it up in a bow and, and, um, and hopefully people unwrapping it agree with us that it solves a lot of, lot of challenges, I think, that haven't typically been solved before. Terrific. Yeah, it does seem like developer experience is at the center of what a lot of people are doing right now. They just kind of realize they're the key to everything. Right. <laughs> yes. And and in, in test, especially in terms of like how effective a single engineer can be at your uh, com yeah. company, I think is like really important because it, it gets to that aspect of how competitive can you be in your own core business uh, if, if you are not able to, you know, be the most productive version of, of yourself as an engineer. Yeah. That's probably a good place for us to wrap up. So I just want to thank um, thank you for joining us again, Rob. It's, it's been a pleasure. Thanks, Heather. Yeah, it's been fantastic being back on. Um, mm -hmm. Hopefully, yeah, I can't wait until we next uh, catch catch up. Yes. And we also want to thank Chronosphere for, for joining us today. And we'd like to thank all of you for joining us here at this On the Road episode of, of the New Stack here on the rather noisy but, but lively floor of QCon plus Cloud Native Con on North America um, here in Chicago. And uh, this has been Heather Joslin for the New Stack Makers. We'll see you next time. If you like this video, please give us a thumbs up. And if you'd like to see more videos like this, you can always subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're on all the major social media platforms. You can always find us at thenewstack.io. We hope to see you soon.